Do you miss it? The order. I miss the idea of it. But not the truth, the weakness. There was no future there. One must destroy in order to create. We have to prepare for the worst. And hope for the best. Nerdorotic.com Greetings, you over 863,000 practitioners of common sense and the 40% who haven't subscribed yet. Just a few short days ago, Disney Star Wars got some really bad news. The Galactic Star Cruiser at Disney World closed forever. A black eye for the House of Mouse, and it's such an embarrassment that even the access media is finally starting to ask what went wrong. Well, that answer has been the same as it's been for almost a decade. Kathleen Kennedy. Unfortunately for Lucasfilm, but fortunately for us, the bad news doesn't end there. The permanent closure of the Galactic Star Cruiser comes just a few days prior to Ahsoka's finale dropping. And coincidentally, we just learned a couple of days ago through the Nielsen's that Ahsoka's ratings are dropping. Right out of the top 10 overall and down to number 5 in streaming originals behind shows like The Wheel of Time and being completely destroyed by One Piece. And Disney stock is dropping to a 10 year low. But not to worry because Ahsoka, prior to the finale airing, already won an award. Was this award for the most effective brainwashing of a dwindling fan base? The most historic achievement of failing upward by an incompetent female executive destroying a beloved intellectual property? Property created by a man? No, believe it or not, it was an award for Ugh, women. Lucasfilm wins big. Ahsoka earns the Sophie seal of female empowerment. And now that Ahsoka is quickly approaching its conclusion on D, the Critics' Choice Association's Women's Committee is recognizing the show for its female driven storytelling written by a man or someone who identifies as a man by awarding it the Sophie seal of female empowerment in entertainment. What the hell is that? Let's find Find out. A press release on Monday confirmed that Ahsoka is the latest recipient of the Sophie, which celebrates outstanding new films and television series that illuminate the female experience and perspective through authentically told female-driven stories. What? According to the statement, Ahsoka received a perfect score in the numerical formula that the organization uses to determine if new titles, which are nominated by the CCA Women's Committee members, are eligible for a Sophie. This includes having a prominent female character arc, giving female characters at least equal screen time to male characters, well, no problem there with Ahsoka, having female leads behind the scenes, and passing elements highlighted in the Bechdel test. Ahsoka received a 10 out of 10 score, and I'm not gonna argue with that. So well done, Ahsoka won an award for women simply existing in a TV show. The Force is female, we all knew that, but here's the problem, it was a joke, Alison Bechtel. The Bechtel test was a joke. I didn't intend for it to become a real gauge. Anyway, when we last checked in with Ahsoka, we were following the adventures of boring women in space in search of balls that will lead them to a ring, which is called the Eye of Scion, which is totally not supposed to be confused with the Eye of Sauron, but don't worry, the Lord of the Rings ripoffs are just beginning. Our award-winning girl bosses are on the hunt to track down the last remaining toxic males in the Disney Star Wars universe. You gotta give Kathleen Kennedy and Dave Filoni credit. They are thorough in their abject failure. It's another female lead. Oh my gosh. So what's happened since then? Previously on Star Wars. You really believe that? Again. I Vadered! He Vadered! 
Outside of that, nothing happened. A colossal, pointless waste of time. Again, at this point, Disney's just desecrating a corpse. A once-beloved, male-dominated franchise that a lot of women liked turned into an intersectional feminist fever dream. Oh, and this can't be stated enough. Disney has done the impossible. They have taken the world's most popular, most beloved, most indestructible cinematic franchise and reduced it to a category on a fledgling streaming service. And the pattern with D plus shows, be it Disney Star Wars or Disney Marvel repeats again and again. Starts out with hype, the keys start jingling, and it's followed by disappointment. <laughs> Sure, we saw some ships flying, Jedi's leaping. We saw some cute little creatures speaking their cute little creature language. Bumblebee tuna. Bumblebee tuna. Also, fake YouTube reactors can make their excruciating reactions. Get up, come on, I can see you there. Cool, a new creature. Oh, I know, it's so exciting. I love Star Wars. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. Very there were a lot of smirks. There were space whales with hyperspace buttholes. Unfortunately, we were missing important things like characterization and a story. I've read coloring books with more complexity than this. So through episodes one through seven, what did we learn? Well, the New Republic is an incompetent matriarchy. When presented with indisputable holographic evidence that there were force users that killed an entire ship's crew, destroyed the ship, and stole a valuable prisoner who just so happened to run one of the biggest shipyards for the Empire, and on top of that, they knew about Moff Gideon, which means they had to know about the plot surrounding Baby Yoda to take his blood, create an army of Beskar armored dark troopers, create four sensitive clones of Moff Gideon to incorporate in that army, and after seven episodes, the New Republic still says, Nah, it'll be fine. To be fair, that's completely consistent with everything we've seen from the New Republic in the entirety of Disney Star Wars. And the character of Morgan Elsbeth remains the shining example of what a Disney girl boss is, which coincidentally mirrors perfectly what your average female Disney diversity executive is. Devoid of personality and solace. What are her wants? What are her needs? What's her motivation? I have no idea. What's her character arc? I can answer that. She doesn't have one. Remember the Maroc? Remember the Maroc theories? Is he Ezra? Bridger? Is he Mara Jade? Is he Galen Merrick? Is he Baby Yoda? Is he Ephraim Zimbalist Jr.? Turns out he was just a fart in the wind, literally. Then there's Ray Stevenson Schnauzer. Again, what does she want? What's her goal aside from asking a lot of questions? Why Lothal? What happens when we find Thrawn? What is it, Master? Do you know the one she seeks so desperately? Do you miss it? You won't help? Shut up, bitch! Oh my God. Now, Balin did say she was trained to be something else. Maybe we'll find out what that is by the final episode. This brings us to General Hera, and let's just pretend I haven't watched some of the Rebel episodes, and let's just pretend I came into this show cold. The only thing I would know about this character is she likes to take her child on dangerous missions, which again, to be fair, is a bit of a tradition here at Disney Star Wars. I'm over the flats with some fighters in pursuit. And the other thing I know about General Hera is she's a general. Classified. I'm a general. Nothing's classified to me. Well, when you're a general, you can disobey orders too. I do seem to remember Hera from Rebels having somewhat of a personality, but that's not the case here. Then, of course, there's those gratuitous ass shots. See, I can be positive about the show. Then there's Lord Balin, played by the late Ray Stevenson, who was a really nice guy. I got to hang out with him for a day in my comic shop. May he rest in peace, who was easily the best thing in this show, but it's because of his mere presence alone. Unfortunately, his character turned in to be like every other character in this show. Nothing. Despite Despite his little Pekingese asking him question after question, he really didn't answer any, and his character started to sound like the Sphinx from Mystery Men. That sort of power is fleeting. What I seek is the beginning. The enemy of our enemy is our friend. For now, I see what once was the great witch kingdom of the Death Miri. He who questions training only trains himself at asking questions. What? 
We do know that he felt called to something in the other galaxy where Thrawn and Ezra were. Maybe we'll find out what that is in the final episode. Then there's Ezra Bridger from Rebels, and again, if you hadn't seen that show, you would have no idea who this guy is, other than it was someone Sabine very platonically liked. That's why when Sabine found Ezra, it was the single worst reunion of two characters no one knows, with all the emotional impact of returning to work on Monday. And it's impossible to ignore the main character of Ahsoka, Sabine, our sassy, smirky, go-girl boss on her hero's journey, based on your average garden variety 2016 SJW who spent most of her time on Tumblr. She has impenetrable makeup, and is a character who is about as exciting as a room temperature glass of water. Just look at this scene after she risks it all on the hopes of saving Ezra after she thinks she got her master Ahsoka killed and betrayed her entire mission. I was hoping for a room with a view. <laughs> Again, she thinks her master Ahsoka is dead and she couldn't give a crap. And no, there has been no reference at all, not even a wince since she was stabbed in the gut with a lightsaber. Now, once again, if you haven't watched Rebels, who the hell is Sabine? What does she want? Outside of finding her very platonic friend Ezra, which she has done and doesn't seem that excited about. Well, let's keep in mind that this is mystery box bullshit, and Sabine is on the hero's journey, so we will most certainly get our answer in the final episode. This show is called Ahsoka. Unfortunately, our titular character is one of the worst things in it. She likes chasing balls. Her lightsaber ability is less than stellar. She really doesn't like showing things like emotion or doing anything like changing a facial expression. She does like to cross her arms, and as much as I hate to say this, Rosario Dawson was completely outdone by the younger version in the pointless flashback. Yes, the show is named after Ahsoka. Yes, Ahsoka is in it, but it's not about Ahsoka. But we did find out Jedi can get knocked out and float in an ocean for half a day without drowning, and have a 10-hour dream about Anakin. <laughs> that other Jedi can hear. Well, you know that big bad Grand Admiral Thrawn from the now defunct extended universe and he also appeared in Rebels that everyone's been looking for this entire show? Well, in the sixth episode of an eight episode series, Ahsoka finally finds Thrawn. How? She travels in the mouth of a space whale. And let's not forget Thrawn, from the EU anyway, is the most brilliant of the Emperor's minions. He has risen to power thanks to his tactical brilliance and cunning and has been described as one of the most threatening antagonists in the Star Wars universe. He is an unparalleled military strategist and tactical genius who has made extensive study of military intelligence and the artwork of other cultures. Unfortunately, in what I saw with Rebels and this show, not so much. Looks like he's let himself go a little bit. As Razor Fist puts it, he has the posture of a seahorse. Of course, being a male character in live action Disney Star Wars, he has to rely heavily on a group of women, notably Lucasfilm middle management. I'm sorry, the Night Sisters of Dathomir. Thrawn honors Balin's word and allows Sabine to go to find Ezra, which she does within an hour without equipment. After fighting off five or six guys, then Thrawn double crosses Sabine by sending out Balin and his Shih Tzu to go kill them. The master strategist also knows Ahsoka is coming and allows her to choose her own path to stay one step ahead of her. Our heroes are reunited and Thrawn's plans seem to be thwarted, except he was one step ahead of them. He was just wasting their time while he loaded up his special packages from Space Columbia. Which is interesting, while Thrawn was wasting Ahsoka and Sabine's time, this show was wasting ours. And we can't forget Anakin Skywalker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the guy whose story ended in Return of the Jedi, and probably the only real character what's left of the Star Wars fandom tuned into the show to see. And like this show, it was completely pointless. After Ahsoka is defeated by Ray Stevenson, she floats for hours in the ocean and has a dream about the world between worlds, where we go down the Memberberry Highway, and we get to see a de-aged Anakin oh! with a young Ahsoka going through things like the Clone Wars and the Battle of Mandalore, and was he trying to teach her some deep, meaningful lesson? Was there a dark revelation? Is she really talking to Anakin? <gasps> or is he just in her head? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't care. And neither did the writers, because apparently it was just her imagination trying to talk her into living after being in the ocean for 12 hours. But that's not the only cameo. Oh no, apparently Anakin... <laughs> created 20 training videos for Ahsoka, and there's one more Anakin cameo after this. Oh my god! Oh my god! That's a lot of Anakin. <laughs> so in the Ahsoka finale, were setups fulfilled, questions answered, 
Were there any major revelations? Were character arcs completed in a satisfying manner? The short answer is no. The episode opens up with Morgan Elsbeth getting a promotion from the Lucasfilm management, which looks like your typical Lucasfilm job evaluation. Do you pledge yourself to the sisterhood, to the magics, to the old ways? Then they make her a fart sword, which I'm not gonna lie is leading up to a battle for the ages. Oh, I'm sorry the middle-aged. When we last left our heroes, they were desperate to stop Thrawn from returning, so desperate that they're moving slowly with a bunch of snail people having a chit-chat on top of the ship. This is a point where Disney Plus analytics dictates something needs to happen. Luckily, our heroes and male feminist ally are attacked by two TIE fighter pilots that find the working conditions under Thrawn so horrible, they're worse than making iPhones in China. That's the only explanation I could come up with since they decided to end it all. As Thrawn prepares to leave with his special packages from Space Columbia, the Star Destroyer takes off as slow as the sky base crashed in Black Widow. And our heroes are out to stop them. And that's right, we've got three Jedis and two Wargs. Guess who's sitting, bitch? The master strategist Thrawn, who I have to remind you has an entire Star Destroyer, entire battalions of troops, entire squadrons of pilots who can fly multiple ships, who currently has a Star Destroyer, quote unquote, raining hell on our two and a half Jedi, and completely missing decides to defend from a ground assault from three people by putting troops inside they fight some zombie stormtroopers which might have been a good idea but not here come to think of it the zombie stormtrooper thing would have come in handy a couple of episodes ago but all of that is immaterial because everything was leading to this groundbreaking event the historic first all middle-aged female hr management lightsaber duel <laughs> That's right, Ahsoka Tano and Morgan Elsbeth in a duel to the death fighting like middle-aged women. And the hero's journey is complete. Screw Luke Skywalker, what a pussy, it took him three movies. Sabine only took five minutes to become a Jedi. She helped open a door, she got a lightsaber on her own, and she helped Ezra marry Poppins onto a Star Destroyer. Go. Although that last one might have been too many transgalactic tacos instead of the force. Thrawn gets away, Sabine abandons Ezra on a Star Destroyer. Also, she could be with her lover. I'm sorry, Master Ahsoka. Master and submissive, I'm sorry, Master and Apprentice slowly walk back to Snail Town and look at stuff for a long while to pad watch minutes for Disney+. Plus. Ray Stevenson's Cocker Spaniel joins the indigenous people that she just met yesterday, and both he and his little pug got a combined zero lines of dialogue in this episode. Ray Stevenson stands on the pillars of Argonaut, looking towards Mordor, paying homage or outright ripping off a better story, Lord of the Rings. There's the Eye of Sion, which is totally not like the Eye of Sauron, which I know is from KOTOR thanks to Garrett, and I don't care, they still ripped off Tolkien. There's also the Wargs, Ahsoka the White, and the Pillars of Argonoth. This is what happened last night with the videos showing this fireball in the sky and then bang, almost like some kind of explosion uh, that we see from a war zone uh, and a huge plume of, of flame and smoke uh, high into the air in the Oxfordshire uh, nighttime. To be fair, that explosion in Oxford probably had a little bit to do with some pent up energy from the Rings of Power as well. So Thrawn makes it to Dathomir. Somehow Ezra, disguised as a stormtrooper, including the helmet, while piloting an Imperial shuttle, finds the ships of the New Republic that didn't exist the last time he was in the galaxy. And Sabine and Ahsoka are stranded in another galaxy, but at least they can be comforted by our last member, Barry, the Force Ghost of Anakin. <laughs> That's right, Anakin. Whoa! Anakin Skywalker. Oh my God! And here ends another pointless adventure from Disney and Lucasfilm on D+. Ahsoka, a show that completely ignores the real Last Jedi, so the other Last Jedi could look for another Last Jedi while being pursued by a former Last Jedi. And I still marvel that people think that Disney Star Wars is about something and that it's going somewhere. This is just the latest example, it's not. But sure, I still have some questions concerning season one of Ahsoka. What was calling to Balin across the universe that wasn't the witches of Lucasfilm? Balin said he was training his little Pomeranian to be something else. What was that? What was Thrawn?
Thrawn loading into his Star Destroyer. Why would you cast Wes Chapman from The Expanse and just make him a stormtrooper taking orders? How did Sabine become a Jedi in five minutes? Why didn't Ezra take his lightsaber back from Sabine? Oh, oh, I know the answer to this one. Lucasfilm wanted to represent a man refusing to take his dick back. Why does Hera always have those fucking goggles on her head that she never uses? How did Ezra avoid detection on Thrawn's Star Destroyer on a trip between galaxies? How did Ezra steal one of Thrawn's shuttles on Thrawn's Star Destroyer without being detected? How did Ezra find the New Republic ships of a New Republic that didn't exist the last time he was in this galaxy? Why did all of this happen off screen? Since we heard lines like, It's heir to the Empire. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Why didn't somebody say, we're in the middle of some Star Wars? But Disney would like to thank everyone for consuming current Disney Marvel content and promises that something may or may not happen in next Disney Star Wars content. At this point, I don't know what else there is to say, but I have to admit, I don't think there's any better representation of female empowerment than Ahsoka. A bunch of boring women in space getting lost. And this is just the latest example of one of the biggest failures in entertainment history. Ahsoka is everything wrong with Disney Star Wars. If you like what you heard, please like, share, and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, I thank you for listening this long. I will see you in the next video. Red. That's red.